Welcome to Broadcast to Post by Keycode Media, where we explore the latest trends and innovations shaping the world of media production from broadcast to post-production. In today's episode, we're diving into the release of NDI 6, which is a groundbreaking update to the NDI protocol. Joining us are two experts in the field, Charles Steinkuhler from the NDI team and Brett Collins from BC Live Productions. Together, we're going to explore the key new features of NDI 6, which include HDR, 10-bit color support, as well as improved WAN connectivity for devices through the NDI bridge utility. We'll dive into the impact of NDI 6 on the industry and discuss what the future holds for this innovative video standard. NDI was one of the first video over IP standards widely implemented in the live and now broadcast industry. In introduced as a free-to-use protocol, it's currently in use worldwide as it is a flexible way to control devices and send their audio, video, and metadata across standard networks bi-directionally and with very low latency, even up to 4K image sizes. So stay tuned for an engaging conversation filled with industry insights and practical applications. Uh, Charles Brett, welcome to the party. Um, Charles, uh, let's get started uh, getting to know you. Tell us your story your background, what led you to, be, to becoming the Director of Technology at NDI, and then maybe get a little into what you've been doing behind the scenes with the VizRT NDI team. Sure, uh, thanks for having me, Jeff. Uh, very glad to be here. So I started out with new tech um, a very, very, very long time ago. So <laughs> I'm not sure uh, most of the audience might remember, but uh, uh, computers didn't have hard drives. Uh, computers didn't have color video outputs. Um, it came along and changed all that, uh, and New Tech took advantage of that with the, first the DigiView and then the Video Toaster product, uh, which really drove the desktop video uh, revolution. So I, I, I could I could sit here for hours and tell stories about the old days, but uh, that, like I said, was a very long time ago. Um, I essentially have been involved mostly on the hardware development side at NewTek since the uh, 80s when I when I started through the 90s with the toaster and then we got into the TriCasters and, and all of the products we have now, uh, control surfaces, and um, really got started working with NDI at a very low level. Uh, we needed to port the NDI codec into hardware for FPGA products. So if people want to make hardware uh, devices that would talk NDI. And uh, we needed to port to uh, uh, the ARM architecture uh, when Mac decided that they want to do the whole M1 silicon thing. Um, and all of a sudden, our very nice advanced x86 assembly codec is not very useful on a, on a Mac. So <clears throat> that really got me tied in with the NDI group um, and uh, sort of went from there. Uh, I'm actually only been with NDI technically since uh, March 1st was my first day as the uh, director of technology for NDI. Um, but uh, my role is to look forward and see where NDI needs to go and how we want to get there and which technologies we should add and which technologies we should not add um, and sort of maintain the uh, maintain the standard going forward and expanding our um, uh, application and user base. That, that sounds great. And um, having having run NDI this morning through my Mac laptop, um, uh, I'm hoping there's going to be some further integrations and discussions with our friends from Apple to make uh, the process easier. Um, I had to do a lot of hacking over the last couple of days to get mm. this to work today. Um, Brett, BC Live, your production company in Burbank's become the go-to resource for live streamed events for major television shows, promotional events, trade show conferences across the world. Um, while your rental product lines have expanded greatly over the years, I consider you to be one of the very early trailblazers in using NDI. Uh, what are some of the examples that, how your team first used NDI for live productions and how are you using it today? Uh, hi guys, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, we we definitely have been early adopters uh, in the NDI space. Uh, we I think we've had almost every flavor of of TriCaster uh, since probably more starting of the around the three hundred kind of series uh, and everything up until the you know the TC two and and all that good stuff today. So um, early on, you know. We were excited uh, when NDI first came out, and I think one of the first implementations we had of it was uh, from convention center sort of standpoint, where we had to distribute 
signals uh, across multiple conference areas and bring that all back to a central location. So that IP transport saved us a lot of a lot of cabling, obviously, and um, and allowed us to to really capitalize on on the infrastructure uh, savings. Uh, what we use it for, I mean, particularly in the pandemic, we saw the use of that ex expand um, greatly with all the Zoom calls and and virtualized inputs that, um, you know, it just, it was not practical to use a lot of copper for all those things. So we've seen a lot of, a lot of use uh, in those sort of, in those sort of shows, um, particularly in, in things like um, we've, we've used it for drafts for NFL for NBA for some uh, major talk show uh, guests and and hosts for uh, for uh, you know when when they weren't able to to put these things on on uh, broadcast television we we had to sort of figure out new ways to bring all those guests in so we've used a lot of stuff there uh, now we're we're seeing a ton of it I mean mainly in places where there's a lot of inputs. So you know, esports and um, conferences is where we see a, a lot of that that usage now. Very cool. Um, so let's get to the main topic. It's probably on everybody's minds and why they tuned in. <laughs> Indy Six is finally here. Uh, Charles, let's uh, we'll hit the the key features um, one by one and and get sure. your thoughts on them. First thing was HDR, ten bit color mm -hmm. support. Um, expectations are the image quality are going to be stronger option for both tier one broadcast and content creators. What's the science that went into achieving HDR10 and, you know, in, into NDI6? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, there's been 10-bit uh, support with NDI for a little while, but it's not really been pushed. And uh, to be frank, uh, until we started trying to do HDR with it, you know, we, we ran into some you know, corner case issues with, okay, yeah, there's 10 bits here, but, you know, it's hard to, to get out or it gets converted to 8 bits somewhere behind the scenes that we didn't know about. And so uh, NDI 6 really fully brings that 10 bit uh, experience, uh, the, the 10 bit quality to uh, NDI, um, uh, makes it a little more symmetrical on getting that, that video into and out of the NDI uh, libraries. So, um, uh, we actually, we call it 10 bit, 10 plus bit. So one of the things, uh, the HX formats now are 10 bit. They're the, the, the 10 bit H264 and H265, uh, codecs. Uh, when you're going higher bandwidth, we actually maintain 11 bits. So you're, you're 11 bits clean from source to, to, uh, uh, receiver. And, you know, you all know uh, SDI is 10 bit. Everybody uses SDI. It's the standard. Everyone we've been we've been asked uh, at NDI for like, well, can we do 10 bit? I want to do 10 bit. I need to do 10 bits. Um, one of the changes that's happened, uh, you know, NDI is its own business unit, and um, uh, part of that is that NDI is looking at NDI as as a standalone. Uh, thing, as opposed to uh, with VizRT and before that with NewTek, it's this thing that we make available for people to pull to pull them into our TriCaster uh, environment. So uh, now we're we're very much looking at NDI as a standalone product and and things that make sense for NDI that wouldn't necessarily be required just because it's like well the TriCaster doesn't need that or a Vectar doesn't need that. Um, now they're going to HDR now as well. So uh, we're all kind of moving to 10 plus bit and to HDR simultaneously, but there will be many other things coming down the, the, the road that will be more specific for filling out the NDI and the, and the feature set for something that doesn't involve a TriCaster sitting in the middle of the uh, equation. Cool. Um, Brett, are you seeing demand for HDR in requests you're getting from your clients? What, what are your thoughts on HDR in NDI? I mean, I love it. I, you know, I, I haven't seen a, a lot of requests for it specifically, um, but I, I think that that also comes down to availability. So um, having it available is is definitely going to encourage people to to use it. I think the people are, um, for the most part, uh, they've been they've been okay with with having, you know, eight. 8 bit obviously that's a it's a request that sits in the back of in the back of the mind certainly for 
for people that are uh, aware of the differences. Um, but, you know, for the most part, um, I think it just comes down to people just want the, the maximum quality without really understanding what those those differences specifically are, but they people know the difference when they see it. So I'm I'm excited to have it to be able to offer it to to clients. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of folks see. Oh, well, that number is bigger than the other number. It, it must be better. Um, <laughs> though we were just beginning to see SDI type infrastructures with HDR, um, you know, connectivity for sporting events, uh, only two years ago. So it's it's one of those things that end, has ended up adding on to um, adding on NDI sources into those environments where people are already doing it. Um, let's jump into um, WAN connectivity. So the, the bridge setup has uh, allowed everyone to bring in cameras and other devices to far-flung environments uh, through the bridge utility, and it makes remote workflows a heck of a lot e easier and less expensive. Uh, Charles, can you start with an example of how this works so we can visualize it? And is it av available today for all NDI-ready cameras? Uh, so it's uh, not available today for everything. Uh, it's available to the camera manufacturers. They would need to add that to their uh, camera product, uh, just the way they uh, uh, have to add, you know, 6.0 and we come out with it. They can still build and sell products with 5.6, or, you know. So we we don't really control that, but it, it's it's available to them. Um, what it does, Bridge is not a new thing. We've had Bridge for a while, but the existing instance of Bridge, you run two separate bridges, one in a join mode and one as a host. Uh, you can run multiple bridges in the join mode that will connect to the host, and that's the magic that glues the NDI streams uh, essentially across the WAN. So what we've made available is a embedded client for the join mode, uh, which can be run on... Uh, hardware platform, a converter box, a camera, uh, a monitor. And that then requires no other outside uh, uh, hardware, no other outside software running. You don't have to have some other piece of code running on your network. So it makes it uh, dramatically simpler to connect uh, remote devices directly to uh, your your host bridge, which is perhaps you know somewhere in the cloud, could be you know across town, halfway around the world. Um, so, Brett, do you have any follow up questions on um, NDI Bridge and how the update is going to affect what you've been up to in the production world? I'm, I mean, I'm curious about um, you know the obviously the biggest challenge with with sending. Um, well, I guess there's, there's two main things that I, I would sort of want to dive into. One is the amount of bandwidth required for, for those sort of sources. And then secondly, the, the timing um, between multiple sources. So um, maybe, Charles, if, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the how the, the bandwidth fluctuates, what the different sort of gradations of of uh, sources can be like, what is the minimum viable bandwidth for a for a WAN source before it starts to break up? And then also, how do we time cameras with with NDI bridge? And yeah, how does that all work? Sure. So uh, bandwidth is going to to basically be the same as your HX2 or HX3 NDI sources. So uh, the existing bridge, if you are feeding an HX source from a local network to your remote network somewhere. Uh, those HX sources are simply passed through. Uh, so the bandwidth is whatever you're, you're, you've set that uh, encoding source to, to, to be for resolution and, and uh, different manufacturers have different adjustability about, on that. Um, if it's speed HQ, uh, if it's high bandwidth, then that will get transcoded into an HX uh, by the bridge appliance, uh, which isn't really a fact, that's a, not a factor here. Um, and then it's sent across the WAN as, uh, as HX. So timing, uh, is an interesting problem. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the benefits and one of the, uh, uh drawbacks perhaps of, of NDI is, uh, unlike the, you know, broadcast video worlds, uh, something like SMPTE 2110, something like Dante, uh, we're not fully controlling time bases, clocks, frame rates, audio sample rates, that sort of thing. We just work with what's there. Um, so, 
you can do a variety of things depending on your application requirements. Uh, you could simply plug your cameras in, stream them to uh, the cloud, and uh, they, you know, those streams can be synchronized, you know, within a frame or two. Uh, if you if you need fully synchronized sources, you can genlock in a variety of different means. Uh, you know, that's that's a it's a fairly solved problem. It could be a blackburst. It could be one of the GPS receivers that you put on the back of your camera. Could, you know, there's uh, some some uh, some manufacturers have uh, network based synchronization to to coordinate cameras. Um, but that's that's an, that happens outside of NDI. Um, but then once the once the frames are generated, once they're converted into NDI and sent on the network, we maintain the the timestamps and the streams and they can be. Um, uh, uh, resynchronized in the uh, in the cloud or at the far end, where you know wherever you're you're sending them. Excellent. So if, if um, sorry, um, so if if there's multiple sources, um, let's say you're shooting a concert, right, and then mm -hmm. you have if you want to if you want to switch remotely, um, so we're talking about gen locking at the source. Uh, is that is that what you're referring to? So the uh, if if you want if if you want a consistent frame you know synchronized frames consistent shutter you know um, all of my cameras running at exactly the same frame rate uh, representing you know frames representing the, the same point in time that is something that has to happen at the source where the actual image is converted into a digital format NDI doesn't doesn't deal with that um, NDI takes the frame from the camera or the converter box or whatever it is that has the video. And uh, we encode it and send it across the network. So the actual frame timing is we we, uh, we make provisions for uh, allowing uh, an application to rely on the NDI library to control the frame timing. But that's for something like uh, like a CG generator or something that's just free running um, mm -hmm. and says, hey, I want to send you 60 frames a second. Please clock me at 60 frames a second. And then. You, you send frame one, you send frame two, and the NDI library will say, hey, you want to send 60 frames a second, we're going to hold you off until that next frame is ready. Um, the way an actual hardware video device would work, the synchron you know, the, that synchronization is implicit in the video hardware uh, that's capturing the frame, that's uh, that video stream that's coming in, an SDI signal, an HDI signal that's got an inherent frame rate. NDI can't change that. That has to be changed you know, upstream of NDI. So then the receiver would be taking um, the so the timestamps are embedded in the frames. Yes. And then it's really up to the receiver to to resync those once it receives them. Yes. Um, and, you know, one of the benefits of NDI is you can get better performance and better synchronization if you are willing to go to the effort of synchronizing your sources where they're generated. Um, but you don't have to. If you're like, you know, I don't really care if uh, it's a few frames off when I do a cut then you just stream it. You, you don't synchronize things and, and it works. Uh, the the TriCaster is, is very much this way. You can get lower latency and more accurate uh, editing if all the sources you feed into it are synchronized, but they don't have to be. We'll, we'll frame sync um, as required. Mm -hmm. so. It's like I the old days of, of, sorry. It's like the old days of heterodyning t, um, switchers. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I know there's a, there was a... Um, a use case for us where, you know, we, particularly in terms of CG, you know, Key and Phil was um, trying to time those two sources with, uh, you know, another protocol was difficult, but obviously with NDI, one of the things I love about it is it, is it contains that alpha channel right. in there. Yeah, the that. alpha, um, so the alpha channel and, you know, the key and fill for that instance, you never have to worry about because the alpha channel is sent right along with that video. You might be a frame or two off from the key and fill of some other channel. But the key and fill for this one are going to be uh, consistent. Awesome. Well, we got the timing right. Um, <laughs> so a large part of the NDI ecosystem comes from uh, that growing list of manufacturers that support it, uh, which today, in, as an example, includes you know folks from Panasonic, Kiloview, VizRT, JVC, and others. Um, Charles, what can you tell us about new partners adopting NDI six and new exciting products from those existing products um what things are able to support ndi six today and what third-party products are on the roadmap without stealing their nab thunder i was just gonna say i you know i don't want to steal anyone's thunder there there's a there's a slightly large uh, trade show coming up in a, a few days <laughs> One um, 
but uh, yeah, but we have, uh, you know, we have uh, publicly released the, you know, NDI six, uh, you know, we've talked about, oh, we got Compromato, Chiron, Telecam, uh, Lumens, uh, Killaview, you know, these are all people we've worked with that have been beta testers for us with NDI six, and uh, we expect to be announcing uh, NDI six based products uh, uh, have or will be announcing uh, very soon. So uh, we're very pleased with um, uh, our partnerships uh, with our licensees. That's 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 what is going to make NDI successful. Um, and we want to uh, again, as we as we take a focus of NDI as a standalone entity. Uh, you know, we've got a, a new leadership team. Uh, we've got a, a, a separate business entity. We're we're still very closely attached to VizRT. Uh, don't get me wrong, but um, we're as a group looking at what NDI can do on its own and uh, coordinating with and cultivating uh, our current and additional partners is key for us uh, moving forward. Uh, very important for us on uh, major features like HDR. Uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of HDR experience uh, in-house, uh, but we work with people, uh, we, we, we work with our, um, our partners who are wanting to adopt it um you know they, they we help them they help us that's how it's supposed to work right that is how it's supposed to work so for for helping helping partners and helping end users brett as someone who uses ndi day in day out for all manner of live productions what would you love to see from charles and the ndi team in future ndi releases do you have a product patch or feature request that would take ndi productions up to that next level uh I think we touched on this before, but I mean, I'd love I'd love to see parity on the um, deployment of NDI tools for both Mac and PC. I think Mac's been been trailing behind on a lot of those tools, um, and it's not a huge issue. Obviously, we have PCs to work with as well, but you know, most of our um, most of our people work predominantly on on Macs for for the day to day. So being able to manage those things from from Mac is is certainly useful. Uh, you know, one thought that I was just having um, as we were preparing for this for this talk was, um, you know, I would love to see in the same way that you know, that the alpha channel is included in, uh, in NDI currently. Um, I wonder if there's a world where we could also have um, some stereoscopic options so that you could, you know, like for for you know VR type applications where you can get left left eye and right eye sort of being transmitted simultaneously. I think that'd be pretty cool. That's a great idea. 3D, interesting. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, so uh, Charles, uh, what types of features and topics is your team exploring for future releases? What's that crystal ball show you and us? Um, well, obviously, you know, we're, we're still very excited about NDI-6, uh, but the future, you know, is, uh, is coming. Uh, technology does not stand still. Um, things that we have actively discussed and are planning, uh, we feel that there's a lot of room for NDI to do more in audio-only applications. So not just video, but audio. Um, we... Uh, also feel there's a, a lot of room for us to grow into some of the automation and control space. Uh, we have, uh, as you mentioned at the start, uh, bi-directional communications, it's network. We have metadata that goes along uh, both with the connection at the connection level, and we have frame level metadata that can be uh, attached to a specific video or audio frame. There's a lot of really powerful things we could do with that. Um, you know, simple things like closed captioning, uh, more complicated things, commercial insertion or uh, uh, system control, uh, con connecting to uh, uh, an array of NDI receivers in a, in, a, in a stadium, perhaps, and having them all switch to a different source uh, for, you know, for video streaming. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of room uh, to, to grow, I think, for NDI in those spaces. It doesn't require also... Uh, you get a massive investment of developer uh, is, you know, it's not some, it's not some open-ended two-year development project where we go and, uh, you know, into the skunk works and put our hats on and, and grind, grind some out for, for ages. Um, things we can easily do now and that uh, I feel 
we as an AI need to sort of spearhead. We've got a lot of people doing very, very interesting things within DI. But one of the things I love about NDI, and I think that makes NDI the protocol it is, is uh, the, 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 the compatibility, interoperability. And, um, uh, you know, if we as NDI can specify, you know, hey, if you want to control a receiver, you know, here's some ways to do it. If you want to, um, you know, insert uh, closed captioning or time code, you know, here's how to do it. Here's how to format the metadata so that everybody can uh, understand it on the other end. And uh, um, we, we can do a lot in there. Standardization is what makes the world go round. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's get into some of our audience questions. Uh, David G is asking now that we're in HDR 10 bit world, uh, 10 bit HDR world, um, what are the bandwidth requirements? So, um, the interesting thing about that is for NDI high bandwidth, it doesn't change. So it's the same codec and it's the same, uh, actual like math behind the scenes. So basically what we're doing is we're feeding more data bits in on the front end and we're we're, we're leave, keeping more on the on the on the way out the the codec has been 11 bits clean for ages um for hx the uh bandwidths will go up i believe slightly uh i haven't actually looked at the specifics but um um it would increase a little cool um so then derek b got a question which is on your I'll have a little bit to say on this. We use Microsoft Teams with NDI enabled, but are learning there are limitations. Zoom is not approved. Any other platforms we could use for something like this? I am speaking through a Zoom session using NDI 5 with a Sony camera right there and a Shure microphone right here. It's not my not my camera on my computer. So thoughts, thoughts on that, Charles? Uh, well, we would like to see NDI uh, as many places as we can, obviously. Um, I'm not uh, intimately familiar with the uh, Teams implementation. Uh, I I did see notification that uh, they had like taken it out and added it back in and um, uh, somewhat recently. Um, but that is definitely... Uh, on our our radar, um, you know that that is our our objective is to uh, you know we, we want to become uh, you know the IP video streaming standard. You know we we want to become the the go to resource if you know you have a video device uh, and a couple of uh, a couple of devices are on a network. You want to stream video and audio between them. We want to be the first thing you think of, um, whether it's Zoom or Teams or cell phones or um, whatever. And uh, just to, to punctuate on that, I'm running Sonoma 14.4. My last webinar, NDI audio was available across the board. I had to do some um, interesting hacks to get the video to work through as there's a security thing inside of Apple that precludes certain camera sources from getting in there. So there's there's ways to do it. You can find it on find out on the internet and I'm running close to the latest version. Um, Don McKinney is asking about super slow-mo. Saw that someone got a super slow-mo system using an ADA 120 frames per second camera over NDI to a vMix server. What is the maximum FIPS that NDI can support? So NDI is software. It has no inherent limits on frame rate, resolution, number of channels of audio, any of that sort of stuff. Um, so from a practical sense, uh, it's the, the hardware that you can throw at it. Um, and, you know, we can, we can process a very large number of NDI streams on products like Vectars and TriCasters. Uh, obviously those are high powered application processor systems. You're not going to get that on a small arm chip in a, uh, in an embedded converter box or something. Uh, but no, there's, there's, there's fundamentally no, uh, inherent limitation where you can't send 8k frames, uh, 120 frames a second, uh, Till you know, run out of network bandwidth, processing power. Um, that's you know, those are your limits. Charles, can I ask a question? Just um, in sure. relation to um, you know, because one of the, I think one of the the overarching challenges with a lot of these implementations is is really the network limitations. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm curious about you know, is there is there a world where you know the NDI um analysis tool i know i know that there's there's some um cli tools out there for for this for this sort of stuff i'm just curious is there a world where there could be 
you know, a, a, a GUI that, that deals with, you know, network analysis, not just from the NDI standpoint, but, you know, there are certain, if, to know if certain services are blocked, like if MDS, MDNS is blocked on a corporate network or, you know, somewhere that you go into, uh, you you know some of your your discovery is not yeah, going to yeah. work so, so just yeah uh, I I understand um, actually uh, when we were uh, when I was discussing previously about uh, you know future monitoring and and tools like that is is another one of our uh, you know that is on our roadmap we realize the need um, it's a complicated uh, solution space the you know uh, you know, one of the one of the the things people like about NDI, you plug it in and and it works, right? But like you said, the, except it doesn't, and then you know, uh, you don't want to have to be a network engineer to figure out why. Um, and uh, yeah, there are there are things we can do to make that easier. That that is on our list uh, uh, for for future enhancements, uh, additional monitoring. Uh, we have a, a lot of people uh, ask us for that. Uh, you know, in the broadcast space, you know, people want uh, you want that confidence monitor, right? You want to know my signal is actually going out. Somebody's actually seeing it. Um, so we are uh, we are aware. We're actually talking. Uh, we'll be talking at NAB with. Uh, some partners about that. Um, so it's, you know, there will be more of that coming, yes. Cool. Um, and then I think we kind of covered this, but Dan was asking, how does one sync these frames on the camera end? Um, I mean, that's standard sync, syncing yeah. stuff, whether it's Black Burst or Tri-Level. Right, that. that's, a, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's camera dependent. So, yeah. you know, that's going to be, right, you, you run your Black Burst or, uh, you know, the camera's got some, uh, you know, fancy network protocol and it talks PTP and you got to do something weird with your network switches or um, uh, you have an SDI reference. But, but yeah, you, you provide some sort of reference to the camera. Um, so you know, NDI, does not, NDI does not handle that on its own. Cool. Uh, and then two questions about um, bridge and on it being on devices. Um, Randall is asking if the NDI bridge on a device is still bidirectional. And then Robert is saying bidirectional NDI on hardware would change the world. For example, a camera decoder in the field with talkback tally video return and a studio on the other side. So the bridge application is, um, I believe, at the moment, uh, one channel, so a one stream. So it would be um, uh, one direction. Um, but uh, you know, that's it, it's software. That's something we can we can look at. Um, it's intended at the moment uh, to be implemented on a you know a device, a converter device, a camera that would be you know processing a stream, um, not uh, you know. Not, not four or five so um but uh there's no reason you know a bridge appliance is a you know is a possibility um but uh, uh that's not something that's currently on the roadmap now i did see a camera which had an hdmi out which in the future is supposed to allow tally or prompter or tally prompter or return video to pop up so it, the functionalities i think will be there pretty quick on the hardware side mm -hmm. and it's just be, going to be a question of how bridge is going to handle them um interesting other question ndi6 does it have any enhancements with regard to crossing vlans and that was from frank crossing vlans um not other than the you know bridge uh, separate VLANs are, are basically separate networks. So as far as NDI is concerned, you know that's the same thing. Um, NDI bridge and TCP routing and that sort of thing doesn't really care if you've got two VLANs that are right next to each other on the same physical ether equipment or they're separated by you know an ocean and half the world away. Yeah, and network design. There's a lot of interesting things that can be done there because. Occasionally, you don't want to cross the screen streams to quote the Ghostbuster people. Um, it's not a good idea to have NDI begin wandering around on networks that are used for other protocols or other other uh, other jobs. Um, so people will become a little upset when all of a sudden all their email stops working because they didn't build that other VLAN with the expectation of running lots of video around it. 
Right. And the, that, I mean, that's the whole point of a VLAN is you're separating the traffic. You're, you know, if you want it together, you don't put it on separate VLAN. Yep. So. Um, there's a quick question. NC2, NDI6 support. That's from Alex. Um, it, you know, they will add that. I, I, I'm not aware of the time frame. Cool. And then Adrian's asking, NDI tool six is six. Is there an improvement in screen capture um, as the quality needs for esports are greater? Um, is, is the screen capture going to be able to also um, produce HDR? Um, I don't. Rem I, uh, that's a good question. Honestly, I, I don't have an answer for the screen capture and HDR. Um, I don't know that. I don't know that. It, uh, I don't know that they have added that yet, uh, but they they may. So, and Brad, are you seeing a lot of uses for screen capture in in some of your productions? Yeah, uh, that's that's a fairly fairly common thing for us. Yep, and the the good thing is it's not camera dependent, so that'll be that'll be one thing that'll live almost all exclusively in software. So we'll um, probably an easy ask, but like you know, like Charles said. Um, don't know the exact roadmap on that. So speaking of roadmap, let's go through some rapid fire questions here. Mini GP racing. We need some audio only products, stage box mixer, IO devices, something like that out there. Um, we want there to be, uh, I said, you know, uh, audio and audio only, you know, uh, you know, audio transport with NDI and audio only, uh, devices and applications are something that we would like to see more of. So. Um, you'll see a little uh, of that coming from uh, VizRT uh, in not immediate future, but uh, uh, down the road. Um, and we'd, I'd like to see I'd like to see the ecosystem develop some of those products as well. Uh, if you take a look at the, if you're familiar with the uh, new Flex control surfaces uh, that Viz has released, uh, those have audio on the uh, audio jacks on the back. Those are driven by NDI. Um, Cool. Um, and then one thing to be clear, NDI6 did just drop, wasn't it last Wednesday or um, Thursday? Yeah, the second or third, something like that. Okay. So the answer to this next question, keep that in mind. That just came out. Um, TC Conway and Caesar are asking, uh, NDI and NLEs, Adobe and Avid are, are great. Um, are they going to come out with NDI6? Any roadmap for DaVinci Resolve? Are you working with Blackmagic on any products? Oh, quite a bit in there. <laughs> um, Lot to unpack. Yes. Uh, so we have the um, plugins that are released as part of tools. So those have been updated. Um, as for anything that is not uh, already part of tools, we're in discussions with a variety of people, uh, uh, including several of the ones you mentioned. Um, about integrating NDI natively into their products. Um, you know, those are ongoing, those discussions are ongoing and uh, there's nothing I can talk about in, in detail right now. And the the thing is also interesting is I know that Avid and Adobe use their standard output methodology to access NDI as an output source or destination. Um, Blackmagic makes output hardware. So mm -hmm. just keep that in mind when you're asking for a non-hardware device for output. Um, let's see. And then the last question. question. Just, sure. a, just a quick question about um, security. You know, as we talk about when, um, when transmission, what sort of uh, security encryption is, is NDI sort of implementing to secure those streams? So the streams going out on the WAN are encrypted. Um, and there's a key that you have to uh, exchange between the, the the bridge hosts to be able to connect to you know, to connect them together. Uh, but in a in a broader and more general sense, uh, security is uh, again one of well, it's one of the the application areas that we have a lot of room to grow. Uh, NDI. One of the assumptions of NDI is it's running on a trusted network, and no one's going to come and do nefarious things or try to attack your uh, uh, camera or or display or, or or whatnot, and you know, to be to be blunt, the, those sorts of assumptions just don't work in the modern world. Uh, everything is too networked. Um, you know, you see the stories of the 
internet thermostats and light bulbs and everything else that are turned into you know uh, DOS uh, zombies and you know it's uh, yeah there's there's that is another uh, along with you know the monitoring and such that's another area that the NDI needs to uh, address uh, somewhat to, to grow up uh, to to mature and and to to get into um, more uh, more markets that we would like to to grow into. What what's that level of encryption um, in the in the bridge set up across a across a WAN currently? Oh, I I don't have the answer for that the off the top of my head. Um, it's it's standard. You know, we're using standard uh, uh, encryption standard AES libraries, and, and, but I I don't know the details of which protocols they specifically do or don't support. Yeah, we we had a, a client yesterday that called in with ransomware attacks so that that's still something that's out there attacking people's environments and yes. the last thing we want is well they they came in with your uh came in with your show and got got your servers that's never never a good piece there um so uh alex has a question that they're using uh screen capture as kvm quite extensively any chance of adding password protections for kvm control in the future no pass is a view only and pass is actual full control um, it's, that's certainly possible. Um, uh, across the product line, um, um, you know, the security is, a uh, is an issue. Um, the, uh, a lot of the things that we are wanting to do with NDI places where we want to go, I, I talked about, uh, automation, um, uh, workflows, uh, uh, being able to control a receiver remotely. These are all things that require user identification, user authentication, and uh, possibly some form of encryption. So um, at the moment that is uh, you know, not on the, the roadmap from a timeline standpoint, but that is definitely uh, uh, an area we are growing into and looking at. Very cool. Um, one other thing to kind of bring to a close as nobody thinks about it till the end usually closed captioning um ryan's asking it was proposed in 2018 are we there yet well not with ndi6 no um but uh uh yes that's that's one of the things i i would very much like to see happen there's a number of um <sighs> The, the standards recommended practices uh, you know you go through SIMPTE and there's a laundry list of things for you know this is how you insert an ancillary data packet if you want closed captioning if you want time code if you want this 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 um, there's absolutely no reason why all of that can't also be done with NDI we send metadata packets it's XML it can be anything um, what we need is a, a standardized way of applying this is how you you know you, you want to do it you want to wrap this thing that you would put in SIMPTE uh, simply stream this way well this is how you would do it in ndi and that is very very much on the roadmap uh for the uh uh nearer term versus longer term um it's just finding available time and bandwidth to um uh, get things done time and bandwidth this is the one thing <laughs> we well we don't get more time we can always add a little more bandwidth occasionally um we're also getting a whole slew of uh of questions about very specific product use cases in NDI 6. What mm -hmm. we're going to do is we're going to bundle those all up, get those notes over to the NDI team so they can they can work through those as either requests or um, you know th something to start working on with a particular manufacturer as there's only a certain amount of time and bandwidth to, to service all sorts of requests. Um, and with that, um, you know, gentlemen, thanks for for joining me here today to talk about the the exciting stuff with NDI 6. Uh, Charlie, I know you got a, a busy uh, week and a half in front of you yes. with NAB coming up and and all the evangelization of getting the word out. And Brett, always great to see you. Um, and my apologies to Matt Damon. That's all the time we've got. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for watching Broadcast to Post. Please make sure to subscribe to the podcast to receive future episodes. Follow Keycode Media on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram to receive news on additional AV, broadcast, and post-production technology content. See you next time, folks.